Hello, welcome to Timeform's Horses to Follow for the 22-23 jump season. It's the name of the show because it's the name of the best-selling book, this one right here, the latest edition of which is out now for you to buy on Amazon for just $10.95. The book always sells out, so order your copy ASAP to avoid disappointment. It's 136 pages with 50 horses to watch out for over the coming month. Rising stars, trainer tips, statistics, form compiled by industry leading experts. Two of which are with us right now. Sport and Life tipster Matt Brocklebank and Timeform Jumps editor Dan Barber. Chaps, you well? Very, Very yeah. Good, good. Dan, there's always a twinkle in your eye at this time of the uh, year as the jump season comes upon us. So with that twinkle, where is it focused? What particular horse are you looking at? Honestly, I could choose several. I bet Matt's the same. Because it, it's weird. You Summer jumps, flat, whatever you go to follow when the proper jump season isn't on. I think you forget names. You shouldn't really be admitting this. But there are names you forget and then you see it entered up in October time thinking, oh, Springwell Bay, for instance, of John Joe O'Neill's who we saw in second week in October, for instance. You think, oh yeah, I forgot about him. He was brilliant. Um, but these two in particular st have stood out for me. And I've tried to do it, a horse I've seen on track and a horse that just generally I really like. And the latter of those is a horse called Rafferty's Return of Rebecca Menzies in the famous John Wade Silks. Here he is far side. He's just got such a likeable demeanour. Really enthusiastic. The type who galloped through a wall. And he's a very fluent jumper. You saw him at the last there. This is the stage of a race on bad ground at Weatherby where he should be getting tired, but his, his technique holds up every time. He's got one blob on his record so far, but I don't think the trip suited him and he was probably over the top for the season. But everything about him to me suggests this is the sort of strong running horse that will be even better over fences. And there are relatively easy pickings in the north. I think he'll make hay. And he's just a horse to follow in two to two and a half mile novice chases and novice handicap chases when he can get in front and just bully the opposition, which is what he did over hurdles. Matt, I'm only fair, I've let Dan have one, so I'll let him have a second in a minute. What about your first one? Yeah, well, I think I'd say mine is probably more of a, a shining light and a horse that's hopefully going to go all the way to kind of the big spring festivals. A horse called El Fabiolo, trained by our columnist Willie Mullins. Now, he's probably not ended the season um, quite in the same light as some of other Willie's uh, novice hurdlers, but I thought we were only really scratching the surface with this horse. Um, he was listed place in France as a younger horse, obviously a really good grounding. And then after uh, winning a Tremor Maiden, he skipped the Leopardstown Dublin Racing Festival. He skipped Cheltenham as well. I think he had a bit of a cut or there was a bit of an issue with him heading to, to Dublin. But here he was thrown in the deep end. He ran in the grade one top novice hurdle. This was John Bonn he came up against. Now, John Bonn was obviously kicked into touch by Constitution Hill. So I think we're, we're talking about that horse as being a real monster out on his own. So this, this horse is uh, probably one that's going to go a novice chasing, a bit like Dan's, but uh, hopefully playing his trade at a slightly higher level. He, he was an adequate hurdler. I just think he was one of those big, gangly, raw yeah. horses that they were getting in his way. And I could see him really improving. I mean, you know, he's already very, very good. He's, I think he's one five two with time form. He's the sort of horse that could really step up another eight or ten pounds with a fence in front of him. And obviously, mentioned Cheltenham, Willie Mullins, you mentioned in there as well, the, the king of Cheltenham in recent years. It feels like we're just constantly, as soon as jump, even before the jump season started, we're talking Cheltenham, we're talking Cheltenham. So, should people be looking at bets from the off now for Cheltenham, or should they be waiting for a while? I think it depends. I think it's something you sort of try and revisit as and when something springs to mind. In the case of El Fabiolo, you could be pretty confident the route he's going to go. I mean, the first thing that Matt says about him is the first thing out of the size of the thing. I mean, John Bond's not some sort of pony. He's sort of towering above him. just yeah. looks a complete brute. So if you can have conviction that a horse is going for a particular race, of course price is massively key. Do you think that's value? You've always got the unknown of setbacks, etc. as he suffered last season, of course. But I think it's something you sort of, I'd almost revisit on a Monday. The weekend racing's passed. Prices aren't likely to have gone that quickly. Bit of time to reflect. And then it, that's maybe when you want to start building up a, a few bets for Cheltenham. Personally, I've, and we're probably both speaking from experience here, is that you end one season painful with what... experience. <laughs> absolutely. Normally yeah. painful with me, yeah. That as well. I mean, we, we often end the season where we have a horse of this ilk that we think is going to be potentially a real superstar of the next one, and we, they come back the following season and they can barely put one foot in front of the other. Now, 
we've, you know, we've all seen that too many times to suddenly go unloading on anti-post Cheltenham um, bets already before Christmas. So personally, I like to see the season settle down a little bit. Um, obviously, you get into the middle of uh, November and looking ahead to those brilliant meetings at Cheltenham, Paddy Power and obviously now the Coral Trophy at, uh, at Newbury as well. So come Christmas, I'd like to think we will have a, a much stronger view. This horse could have run uh, a couple of times by then and his price will have gone. I think he's 10 to 1 for the Arkle already and he's around 12 to 1 for the Turners. Now, he's uh, El Fabiolo, he's closely related, half brother to um, Tommy Silver of uh, Paul Nichols' horse. Now, he stayed two and a half, three miles. So, I would imagine El Fabiolo will get the longer trip. So, it might not be necessarily an Arca project, but definitely a horse to have in mind. And let's be honest, he'll be a short price wherever he goes first time yeah. up. He could end up being a short price in a gr- graded race over Christmas. So, if you're looking for a bit of value, he could be 12 to 1 for the Turners, might be the way to go. The book, uh, always a uh, labour of love. Anyone can just write 50 horses down, but to the research, the detail that is put in, the blood, sweat and tears, it really is a labour of love from the whole Time Form Sporting Life uh, expert panel uh, to put this all together. So well worth buying for just 10 95 Dan, your second horse. Yeah, I felt it, it wise, given uh, travelling around the country for racing TV, you sort of feel like, well, let's put something into practice. Uh, what have I seen on track? And... Not many horses last season caught my eye physically to the extent Strong Leader did. He made his debut in a Warwick bumper. Um, and funnily enough, I'd seen Ollie Murphy, the trainer at Perth, a couple of weeks before, and he was bemoaning the fact that he'd not taken two good bumper horses up to Perth that weekend because he was so happy with the ground up there. In the end, I think he had to sort of draw stumps and say, oh, no, we're not sure the ground will be right, so we'll miss the opportunity. And I posited to him before the Warwick race here as we see him sprinting away first time out is this one of the two that you're really excited about he said oh no he's not actually so I thought oh well that's that's sort of I won't say what it's it involves chips um I thought well if he can do something well the other two might be special but he was just so eye-catching in that race and there's something that won't have been picked up even on the VT there um that once he'd sprinted away as he did, and he was unbelievably impressive visually with Heskin not really moving on him, I recall glancing up to the other side of the track at Warwick and Heskin, the jockey, Aidan Heskin, still hadn't managed to pull him up. He had that much energy left after the race, so he, he barely had a race. He's a striking um, black horse, sort of sprinter sacker esque in that sense, not as big and scopy, but really impressive in appearance. And if he can jump, and he's got a relative strong glance, his full brother, who's almost identical in terms of appearance. He didn't quite take to it as well as you'd have hoped, but I'm hoping this fella books the trend because he's an absolutely beautiful looker. And Matt, what about your second selection? Give us a tease from the book. Yeah, much more of a dark one. Um, one from the book that I picked out. There's a few in the colours of the late Trevor Hemmings, and as someone who sort of grew up real bread and butter in the northwest of uh, England watching these horses win round Haydock and uh, East Street is a horse trained by Sue Smith um, I think is going to be extremely well handicapped now again I was there at Weatherby when he won uh, first time out you know one of Sue Smith's a real long term chasing prospect winning a two mile novice hurdle at Weatherby first time out at 11 to 8 favourite you know you're setting certain alarm bells off um, and he was unable to follow up under the penalty but I thought they, uh, they campaigned him quite nicely I thought because he is going to be a chaser in the making um, a a long term prospect I think his confidence was not slightly he went handicap debut at Catterick and a horse um, fell in front of him quite early on in a race and I just think that knocked his confidence a little bit but uh, he was able to sign off last season with a win that came at Hexham over a, a longer trip two miles four furlongs um, so that was the last time we saw him he's gone up five pounds for that now he's only rated 112 but The horse he actually beat at Weatherby um, in the novice hurdle first time out. He is rated 124 over fences now, having won four times since. So I think we're looking at a really potentially well-handicapped horse purely on what he's done already. But if you factor in that potential and that potential improvement for for jumping fences. So he's another one for novice handicap chases, races that I absolutely love because you can just see these horses blossom into what they were bred to be. uh, Chasers, strong staying chasers of the future. And hopefully East Street can really climb through the ranks from what is a lowly beginning. So that's just a uh, sneak preview of uh, four horses that you can find in Timeforms 50 horses to follow. So another 46 to go for. Quick mass there.
Dan. Well done, Gareth. Strong point at GCSE, but it, it came in useful there. Just very, very quickly, what are you looking forward to generally about the jump season? Uh, for me, generally, it's going racing, seeing the horses, just the thrill and the atmosphere. But there's one thing in particular, and I'll draw you to page 88, actually. I won't turn to camera because the text is quite small in this part, but this is the result from the Supreme Novices. Constitution Hill beat John Bond by 22 lengths. Mm. I mean, this is a horse, one in a million, and the thing I wanted to see in April and I didn't get to see, and the thing I want to see this season instead, is Honeysuckle against Constitution Hill. If that happens, the rest of the season can be a write-off. I just want that to occur. Okay, request from Dan Barber, and Dan normally gets what he wants. <laughs> Matt, what about you? Oh, I, I, anything I say after that would completely undermine <laughs> yeah. the whole piece, Gareth. Yeah, th it's uh, it's Honeysuckle v Constitution Hill. Just go back and look at the way that he won that Sky at Supreme. It was absolutely phenomenal. Phenomenal. No wonder he's the poster boy the, on the front cover of this book. He is uh, he is the horse to look forward to. Uh, well, thanks to Dan and Matt for providing a sneak peek into Timeform's 50 horses to follow for the jump season. Remember to order your copy right now. You can buy direct on Amazon for £10.95 and get more details at timeform.com. Enjoy the jump season and follow the journey with the best analysis, previews, reports, tips and industry interviews with Timeform and Sporting Life.